One of the most dapper individuals I've ever known that I loved with all my heart is Pastor Hawkins. And he is awesome and he's gonna preach a great day, a message for our mothers. God bless you, Pastor Hawkins. Thank you, my mother. Thank you. Wow, praise the Lord. I really, really enjoy that, that choir and that orchestra and those, those two girls, Joe and Erica, singing. Wow. And I've decided when, when I sing, I want those two girls to be my backup singers. <laughs> we can call them the Hawkettes. <laughs> It'll be a great thing. I can't hardly wait. Well, we are a part of a growing church here, aren't we? And that's, that's a good thing. And of course, we understand the challenge is maintaining those personal connections that, that really make a church a church. I, I, I had people come up to me and say, who are you? In fact, Wednesday night, of course, I didn't have my suit on and my hanky. They said, a couple came up to me and said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm Pastor Hawkins. I'm on the staff here. Oh, yeah, you're the guy with the hanky. Now we remember who you are. But that's who I am. I am Donald Hawkins. You can call me the Donald. And uh, <laughs> about four and a half years ago, Pastor Weaver was feeling old, and he wanted to bring someone on staff who would help make him feel young. And I, I'm, I was the man for the job. I really want to wish all of our mothers a very, very happy Mother's Day and a blessed day today. I just love Mother's Day. I'll be honest, I love Mother's Day even more than Father's Day. I just love honoring our mothers. And don't our mothers all look so pretty today? Amen. God bless your moms. And I always enjoy Mother's Day, and, and I, I've tried to evaluate that and I don't know, maybe part of it has to do with the fact of where it is on the calendar. May, this most glorious month. If Mother's Day was in February, I just don't know how I'd feel about it. But I feel really good about Mother's Day, and we have had a wonderful run of beautiful weather, and man, I don't take any of that for granted. I have loved every single day, warm days, cool nights, low humidity. It's about the longest stretch of perfect weather I think I've ever seen. I'm glad I lived long enough to see it. I've surely enjoyed it. Well, Pastor, I get all kind of reactions, too, when, when people know I'm preaching. Uh, I had several people ask me, are you preaching this morning? Uh, first one said, are you preaching this morning? And I said, yes, are you staying? And uh, they said, yes. And I said, then that's your problem. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to deal with that. Someone else said, are, are you preaching this morning? I said, yes. And they said, oh, I think I have another appointment. And a third person, and I'm not exaggerating, all of this is true. A third person said, are you preaching this morning? And I said, yes. They said, well, don't cut into my nap time. I said, it didn't bother anybody in the first service. I think you'll be just fine. Let's start in our Bibles, please. I, see, I don't have any jokes in my sermon, so I'm just stacking them right now. Psalm 22, if you would, please. Psalm 22. And when you see the seriousness of this psalm, you know why there are no jokes here. This is serious and solemn business, but uh, a beautiful, beautiful chapter. And uh, we're going to focus, to begin with, on a couple of verses. But I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we work through this message today. Psalm 22, verse 9 and verse 10. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You know, you look at this and you say, who's talking and to whom are they talking? You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Oh, there's just nothing more precious than our mothers. You are the glue that holds it all together. Without you, we are glueless, and we are clueless. 
And it can't be easy being a mother in today's culture. And like I said, I, I love Mother's Day. It gives us an opportunity to tell you how much we appreciate you, that you're not walking through life unobserved or unappreciated. We thank you for all that you do uh, because we know that we cannot do life without you. So thank you, mothers, for being mothers, and thank God for giving us mothers. Now, chances are you've never heard a Mother's Day sermon from this text, but I find it most appropriate for the day. Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm, which means it really has a double meaning or application. David is surely writing about his own experiences, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's also writing in anticipation or in a prophetic mode about the experiences of his offspring, the king's king and the king of kings. He's writing about the experiences of the Savior who is coming, the promised Messiah. You'll note that a good part of the psalm is about the lifelong impact of a mother upon a child, Mary upon Jesus. There are three pictures I'd like for us to see in this text. The first one is a brief one, but certainly important. And it's presented in a beautiful tapestry of language. First of all, let's see the father tending. The father and his involvement and his care. Now, the Messiah, you'll note as you might work your way through the psalm, is on the cross. Jesus is paying the price for our sins and his physical sufferings are highlighted in detail in verse 14. He says, I am poured out like water, all my bones out of joint, my heart turned to wax. In verse 15, my strength dried up, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He has no water, he can take in no air, he is suffering dehydration and suffocation. In verse 16, they have pierced my hands and feet. So from the cross, this place of unspeakable suffering and humiliation, Jesus looks down and he sees his mother and he pays tribute to the one, the power of the Most High overshadowed, the one in whom the, world, the Word became flesh, the one who held the Messiah at her breast. The one who sang to him songs of faith, stroked his skin, sheltered him in her arms like the ark held Noah, safe from all the storms of life. And his mind takes him back, takes him way back to his earliest days, even his birth. And surely he knows that God has not forsaken him because God has always been with him. In verse 9, he speaks to the Father. He says, you brought me out of the womb. When I was born, you were there. Now, the accusations he hears from the cross is he trusts in God, and yet God is not there for him, but he knows better. He knows better because he was taught better. You brought me out of the womb. You, O oh God, were the attending physician. You were there when I was born. You welcomed me into this world. You heard my first cry. Before I was born, you formed me in my mother's womb, and when I was born, you held me in your hands. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. This holy union of God and mother and child taught Jesus in his earliest years, life's most valuable lesson, that he can trust the Father. And all the lessons that Mary taught Jesus when 
Christ was on her lap when she snuggled him close and whispered into her ear the story she told him of prophets and patriarchs. Verse 10, from birth, I was cast upon you. In my first moments, I was placed in your care. From birth, I belonged to you. It was a holy accord, father, mother, child. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. The unmistakable, intimate activity of God in the birth of Jesus. Now, when we had our two children, I was assigned the responsibility of waiting in the father's waiting room. That's what they had in those days. So there I was reading year old magazines and pacing the floor and praying. It was a strange day in that day. Fathers were put away. They were out of sight. They were in a room at the end of the hall. And when the baby was born, the father could only observe the child by looking through a window, a glass darkly. It was a cruel coalition against fathers. And so the message became pretty obvious. Hello, fathers, bad. Fathers, stay away. Father, on the other side of the glass panel. That's what they did. I don't know why, but they didn't want the father around. I guess they were afraid the fathers would freak out. And I would have, more than likely. But no waiting room here. No glass darkly here. No, the Father God is in the delivery room. He will hear the first cries of this baby. He will usher him out of the womb and into the waiting world. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. The father tending. But secondly, look at the mother teaching. And we're given that very clear indication in verse 9. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. The mother had a lot to do with him learning to trust the father. You know, it's, it's well known, and I'm sorry, Dad, but this is, this is true. Mom is first and she is foremost. It's well known that weeks before a baby uh, even knows the father is around, it has an awareness of its mother. Mother is the first presence, the first love, the first nourisher, the first teacher. And Mary was his very first, his first teacher. Long before he was called teacher, she was his teacher. He was the student. He learned life's most valuable lessons right there on Mary's lap. Now, in those days, a baby wasn't weaned until they were two or three years or even older. So Jesus spent a lot of time learning on Mary's lap. Her lap was his first classroom. She was his first teacher. And trusting God is his, his first lesson. What did she teach him? What great lesson did she pass on? I think the psalm is telling us in its reoccurring theme. It's the theme of trusting in God. You can see trust is the big issue in this psalm. Trust is what is needed. Testing will come, and testing calls for trusting. Look at verse 4. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and you were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you 
even at my mother's breast. How did he learn to trust God through the teaching and the hands-on influence of his precious mother through the legacy of her life? Oh, I'll tell you, she knew a thing or two about trusting God. She had passed that test with flying colors. Who has ever been called upon to trust God to a greater degree than Mary? You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Words that no human being had ever heard had even imagined. And when Mary heard them, she didn't stutter, she didn't stumble, she didn't laugh in disbelief like Sarah. She just said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you have said. Nobody was more qualified to teach Jesus about trusting God than his own mother. So where did God place him? On Mary's lap, where she told him all about the Magi and from the east and the king outwitted and the angel visits and the star visits and Joseph's dreams and Elizabeth's pregnancy. She taught him about Isaiah's prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. She taught him about Micah's prophecy that pinpointed the very place, the very birthplace of Jesus, that little unlikely Bethlehem. So most importantly, he learned about his heavenly father from his earthly mother. She teaches him with an, an authority that no one else could have possessed. She teaches him heart to heart. She teaches him mother to child. She teaches him as one highly favored, blessed among women. This is her time. This is her task. This is her truth. And the baby will hear again and again the lesson he will need again and again, and that is trusting God. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. This leads us to our third point, the father tending, the mother teaching, but please note the child trusting. And this psalm paints a, a rather elaborate and detailed picture of how Jesus was called upon and challenged to trust his father. Mary taught Jesus to trust his heavenly Father. She taught him that God is always trustworthy, always has been. In verse 4, verse 5, in you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. God has a track record. So Mary taught Jesus to trust God and Circumstances become evident as you explore this chapter. First of all, Mary taught Jesus to trust God when you cannot feel His presence. On the cross, Jesus in His human experience, identifying fully with you and me, cannot feel the presence of His Father, it seems. The pain the shock to his system, the physical and emotional and spiritual trauma led him to cry out in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I acknowledge this is a verse that's somewhat controversial. It's open to various interpretation. But the point is, he identifies with us. We identify with him in this because have we not all felt that way? Have we not all gone through life's experiences? Have we not all had those overwhelming encounters in life when we cry out, my God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? 
And in his full identification with us, I have no difficulty believing that the Son of Man also felt that way. But he looks down from the cross. He sees his mother. He remembers. He remembers what she taught him. You can trust God even when you cannot feel his presence. And as the blood pours out of him, the faith pours into him. And in his final words, his trust in God reasserts itself, moves to the forefront, and he, go, he moves from, why have you forsaken me, to, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And even the crowd saw and heard his faith. In verse 8, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Take away. My friends, trust God when you cannot feel his presence because there will be times when you cannot feel his presence, but that does not mean he is not present. And if you'll keep trusting the darkness will dissipate. The sun will rise. Your faith will prove to be stronger than your feelings. Trust God when you cannot feel His presence. Secondly, trust God when your prayers are not answered. Look at verse 2. David said this, but Christ also identifies with this in His brutality on the cross. He says in verse 2, Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. So I am not silent, but God is. And when I pray, He does not answer. Have you ever been there? Sure you have. Some of us have often visited the land of un unanswered prayer. And what do you do when that's your experience? What do you do when the heavens are brass? What do you do when God is silent and there's no evidence that your prayers have made any difference? And that's when many of us fall prey to all kinds of doubt and we lose heart and the doors open so Satan can gain a foothold. I cry out, but you do not answer. Imagine the agony that's poured into those simple, straightforward words. Why? Why, God? Why don't you answer? Don't you care about me? Well, Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, and in his humanity, he was assaulted by doubts and deceptions from the enemy, and Satan, who lurks around every corner, came, comes to him in his suffering and his weakness when he is surrounded by all this mockery and hatred and hostility, and in his worst moments, Satan spews out his accusations. But Jesus will not accept those lies. He knows better. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. And that faith will win the day. It will overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so from you do not answer in verse 2 to verse 24, he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him but has listened to his cry for help. Trust God when your prayers aren't answered. God is still good. God is still listening. God still cares, and God is still at work. And then, trust God when others have turned against you. I may not be talking to many at this point, but I know I'm talking to some and perhaps more than I realize. But trust God when others have turned against you. Did others turn against him? Oh, yes. 
That too was prophesied. He came into his own, and his own received him not. He was despised and rejected of men. Did others turn against him? Oh, like you would not believe. In verse 6, but I am a worm, not a man. Scorned by men and despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Verse 12, many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Verse 13, roaring lions, tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. Verse 16, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. This sinless man, this perfect man, could not make everybody happy. He ended up betrayed, beaten, and crucified. It can be one of life's most bitter experiences to have people turn against you. What do you do? Well, you look to the Lord and you put your trust in Him. Bulls, lions, and dogs surround me. They attack me. They unite in their efforts to destroy me. But in verse 19, but you, O Lord, be not far off. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me. Rescue me. Save me. His faith is in God. Where did he learn such a thing? You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. What a heritage. What a legacy for Mary to give her son. The greatest lesson any mother can learn is to trust God. The greatest lesson any mother can pass on to her child is to trust God. God is good all the time. God is wise. God is sovereign. God is all-powerful, all-knowing. God is altogether trustworthy. So moms, remember that little child you hold upon your lap looks to you and will always look to you as their first teacher and their most profound teacher. What an opportunity and a privilege you have. Teach them well. Teach them there is a good and great God a loving God who will never leave them nor forsake them, a God who can always be trusted. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come, and as they come, I'd like to pray for all of our mothers this morning. If you're not a mother, join me in our prayer prayer support for all of our moms today. Father, in your wisdom, from the beginning, you have given us mothers. And we thank you for that feminine touch that fills our home with love and grace and service and sacrifice. And Lord, today we want to pray for those mothers who have lost mothers. And Mother's Day can never be quite the same. I pray that you will touch their hearts with memories that bring joy and gratitude. We pray for those mothers who feel overwhelmed by the needs and expectations placed upon them. Lord, grant them grace, impart to them peace, and send strength from your great throne of grace. We pray for those mothers who live with unanswered prayers, unrealized dreams, unfulfilled lives. I pray today that there will be a new 
a new power and purpose found in you. Let there be a new awareness of a God-given calling in their lives. We pray for those mothers whose heart aches over a prodigal child. Remind them today, reassure them that no prodigal goes so far that God's powerful and loving arms cannot reach them or falls so low that God's grace cannot redeem them. We pray for those mothers who have suffered, suffered the loss of a child or bear the burden of infertility. Give them a trusting heart that can rest in the one whose ways are above our ways. The one who said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And most of all, Lord, we pray for mothers who have not yet found you as Lord and Savior. May today be that day of discovery, the day of salvation the day of entering into a peace that passes all understanding, a joy unspeakable and full of glory, the day when all things pass away and behold, all things become new. Knowing our God is a very present help, help us to be good receivers of everything you have for us today. May every mother feel the love today, Lord, ours and yours. Hallelujah.